First thing that I would do if you came up to me and said, Julian, you have to now be the most toxic person alive. Gun to the head. Do or die. Here's the first thing that I would do. And once more, do not do this. I'm using counter examples. Do the opposite, but do be aware of this in other people. The first thing that I would do is learn about triangulation. Do you know what this is? And I would bond with it. This is triangulation. Imagine both of you and I were all friends. So it's three of us, like a little triangle. And you're going to see this in a lot of people that you know. They try to bond this way. Triangulation is when, say, me and you were talking. He's not here. And the way that we bond is by talking him down, gossiping about him and insulting him. Then you're gone. I'm with you, and I'm going to bond talking him down. And that is triangulation. Two versus one, just like a triangle. So like, oh, do you hear John? He's doing this thing. Unbelievable. <gasps> Did you hear what Eric said about you, John? Oh, my God. And I would bond with everyone by doing that. Triangulation. <laughs> There's definitely some people. <laughs> you. <laughs> John. <laughs> no more triangulation, John. Enough of that. No, but you'll see people do this. They'll come up and they'll always bring up this other person that either you both know, some other person that maybe they know or that only you know, or even some fictional celebrity. And it's always me and you versus me and you versus terrible. And you know that if they're doing that, by the way, with you, hey, this person, you might try to fall for it because you're like, oh, it's gossip. Yay. But they're going to be doing that behind your back. Be very aware. So triangulation would be one I would definitely do. The next is I would learn how to gaslight like crazy. What is gaslighting? It's ultimately making someone doubt their reality, right? Um, do you like uh, the color blue? Yeah, what's your favorite color? Green? I thought you said you like blue. I like both. No, you like blue. Yeah, not green, blue. No, you're lying to me. You just said you like blue. Why are you lying? I like both. Are you trying to manipulate me? <laughs> I can't believe you. If you're, if you're like what? You're, you're, you can't go back and forth. You said you like blue, and now you're saying you like green? You like both? No. What do you like? No, but don't turn this around on me. <laughs> don't turn this around on me. We're talking about you right now. Why are you doing this? What did I do to you? What did I ever do to you? Nothing. The way you said that, nothing, uh, nothing. Why are you attacking me? Nothing. Oh my God. I'm sorry. That did not even seem genuine. It's... <laughs> no, I'll give you that. It's funny. <laughs> now, that gaslighting. I'm obviously joking. It's green, right? It's green, yeah. You, you can see. He's like, oh, it was blue. <laughs> but notice how everything that he's saying, one, it's devalidating the reality and it's imposing that frame that he's wrong. You'll see this too, by the way. Be very aware in different interactions, people will impose frames. Okay? For example, why, uh, why are you trying so hard right now? Imagine I said that to any of you. Why are you trying so hard right now? Why are you trying so hard right now? Sitting like that with your arms crossed. What about you? What, why are you trying so hard? Are trying to get the attention back on you? It's setting a frame. You're trying hard. And what do we do? We buy into it. I'm not. I'm not trying hard. Or we let it affect us. Be careful. Be very careful. Why are you so negative? You seem really negative right now. See, it's putting on a frame. Hey, you don't have to be, try to be so cool. It's okay. You don't have to qualify yourself. Putting a frame. Falls under gaslighting too. Be very careful. That'd be the second one. Triangulation, gaslighting. Big ones. The next is I would only talk about gossip. The news and anything that falls under the themes of grief, fear, and anger. I take people through this in terms of my scale of transformation. It goes from apathy, grief, fear, anger, courage, desire, purpose, and love. Most humans alive find themselves grief, fear, anger. Just look at the news. That's the news. You'll see articles that pump grief, victimhood, feeling sorry for yourself. Sorry for others, just oh, in that state. You'll see tons of fear and you'll see tons of anger and outrage. 
Why is it that that's what you see the most? Is it because that's what's happening the most in the world? Yes or no? No. Is that the majority of what's happening in the world? Grief, fear, anger? No, there's other things. You could definitely fill an entire news channel with positive news. There's even an Instagram account. Uh, Tanks Good News. Back in the day, I would recommend this account to people. However, even that account got a little weird recently. But the whole premise around that Instagram account was good news only. And people loved it because they're like, we never see good news. When's the last time you saw a happy dappy article about something? Yes? No, never. Very rarely. Or if we see it, most people are like, boring. Let's jump to the Kate Middleton drama. And they go for that. And ultimately, you could say, well, it's not necessarily the news doing it. It's they're just giving you what you want. If most people are in those states, that's what they're going to resonate with. You can't give something at a higher state that they just don't see. Like if I said right now, okay, everyone, I have a crazy story I'm going to share with you. The first is this really happy and inspiring story with a beautiful ending. The second is one of the most embarrassing and darkest times of my life. What do you want to hear? And it has such a terrible twist, and it's so cringe, I don't even know if I want to say it. And I'll get canceled for saying it. Which one do you want? Everyone's like, oh, give us the tea, give us the gossip. Now, when I say this, that'd be the third thing I would do. Look for that in others. Look at when people light up. That's the key. You'll have friends like that. You'll share some good news, and they may be like, oh, that's nice, that's nice. And then... Did you hear about John? Oh, John. And you see their, their eyes go like, whoop, and their tonality go up. John, tell me more. Do they light up around, again, positive things or negative things? And I would just go into the negative. And I'd do a combo of triangulation, gaslighting, negative, gossip topics. Okay? The next thing I would do is I'd be passive aggressive all the time. Hey, Julian, be as toxic as you can be, passive aggressive. What's passive aggressive, especially when it comes to, say, asserting boundaries? It's not telling people how you feel, what's okay, what's not okay, what you're thinking. It's ultimately trying to put the pressure on them and blame them and expect them to define the boundary and express the boundary for you. That's really what it is. Like, say, hypothetically, we're together and we made plans to go out to dinner tonight. And say something came up with uh, a friend of yours and you bail on the dinner because you want to see a friend. And I'm not okay with that, as an example. A healthy thing would be, hey, look, this dinner, that's asserting the boundary. This dinner was important to me. I understand that you have your friends, you want to see your friends, but I really wanted to have dinner with you, et cetera, and I fell hurt by it. And I, I want us that when we have plans like that, we really stick to them, so it's win-win. Instead of saying that and telling him about it, what I'm going to do is he's going to come back from his friends. And what's your name? Ali. Ali? Yeah. I'm going to be passive aggressive. Hey, was it fun? And he's going to be like, well, yeah, are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. What are you talking about? Would I not, what, what, what? Would, do I not look okay? Now, what's my intention is ultimately to do that for him. And I'm expecting him to realize why I'm not okay. I'm expecting him to realize what the boundary was. And I'm going to keep him passive aggressive till he does. And I'll do this with everything if you want me to be as toxic as possible. The next thing I would do is I would make my purpose against something as opposed to for something. Key, audit. You'll see people like, here's my purpose. I want to help people. I want to help people let go. I want to raise the vibe of the world, etc. I want to help them overcome anxiety. It's for, 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 versus my purpose is against this person, against that thing, against, against. And you'll see people create all these purpose-driven things around hate. Now, here's what's interesting. Technically, it could be the exact same path, right? Hey, I'm doing this to help. I'm doing it for this, you could take the same action. I'm doing it against the opposite. But if you're in that against frame, the more competitive frame, it's more toxic. It eats you up inside. And even though the actions could be the same, those actions will be poisoned by it. This is key. Before something, not against something. And people will create all sorts, if they don't have a clear purpose, of toxic purposes like that. Look, all those people are against this. I'm going to join in. 
oh, all these people, especially online, on social media, they're all dissing this person. Let me join in the mob. And they go against, against, against. I would make my purpose against something, and I'd be extremely in a competitive state. I would also never be happy when other people win, ever. Because if they win, it takes away from me. There can only be a limited amount of people who win. We cannot all win, and we are very disconnected. We are not collaborative, we are competitive. If you win, that means I lose. Which, funny enough, if you think of the more collaborative frame, if we're all one, well then your win is my win. If you win, I win. Now here's the catch too. If you don't celebrate other people winning, you're gonna create a ceiling of success when it comes to you winning. Because if you're judging someone when they win, I'll see this all, it's like, oh, screw, like you might see someone in a relationship, you're like, how did that person get that? Why didn't I get that? I deserve that better. I'm a better person. I deserve the better relationship. Or you'll see someone make money. They're selfish, making money. All they think about are themselves. Versus why not being happy? Oh, that's great, they're in a relationship. Oh, good for them, they're making money, yes. If you're against that, you're gonna unconsciously block yourself from perhaps making money because a part of you thinks, hey, I'm gonna get the same criticism towards me. Resisting success in others translates into internally resisting success in yourself. When I see people winning, I'm happy. I'm like, yes, you go. And it doesn't take away anything from you. That's the whole scarcity mindset. So if you told me to be toxic, I'd go into scarcity and definitely be competitive and be really mad when other people win. I would also think and talk using to me versus for me. Life is happening to me. People are doing things to me. This thing's happened to me, da da da, versus for. Instead of looking for the lesson or trying to get better, I would get bitter and I would blame, I would never take responsibility. I would blame others, blame situations. It's never my fault, it happened to me. And I'd go down into that pit, okay? I would also only focus on problems, never solutions. And I would only talk about problems, never solutions. You might know people like this. Here's what's going on with me. Right? And they'll just talk and talk and talk about their problem. They could write a book about their problem. But if you bring up the solution, they do not like it. Especially in the self-help world. You know people outside of this world where you have the answer to what they're struggling with. And when they vent to you and talk to you, are they happy if you actually give them an answer? No. Because they just want to vent. They just want to talk about the problem. Hey, can't you just join me and talk about the problem, about how bad this is? I don't want a solution. Like they freeze and they'll actually start distancing themselves from you or even cut you out if you keep coming back with a solution. Because it's not what they want. They want the pity fest and the problem fest. Let's just talk about that. And they get hooked on it. It becomes like a drug. And that's what I would do. Hey, Julian, be as toxic as you can be. I would just start self-hypnotizing myself into this trance of just being like, problem, poor me, things are happening to me, it's so bad, it's so hard, so on and so forth. And even at home, I would play these fantasies out in my hand about how hard it is, so on and so forth, and I would combine that with everything I talked about before. Another thing I would do is I would try to isolate myself as much as possible from people, and the way that I would do that is I would spend all of my time on social media and I would take my phone with me everywhere I go, and I would always be on my phone. Which, funny enough, if you want one little hack to be more social, people are like, I never meet anyone. Stop going out with your phone. For real. Like, imagine all of you right now went out to a public gathering. Could be an activity, could even be a bar, a restaurant, you name it, and you have no phone. Well, then you have two options. Like, say it's a bar. Most people are like, I'm going to go to the bar to meet people. And they go to the bar and they're just always checking kind of on their phone. Like, oh, I'm too scared to say hi to anyone. Oh. Hey, if you don't have the phone, either you're going to talk to the people around you or you're going to awkwardly stand like this. But you can't retreat into your phone. And that looks a lot weirder. If you're by yourself with your phone, it's easy to be like, scroll, scroll, scroll. No phone, you're just like. <laughs> Everyone's like, what are they doing? It forces you to interact with the environment. The same as walking down the street. If you have your phone and especially your headphones, how are you ever going to meet anyone? It's also creating a very uninviting space. No one wants to interrupt like, hey, excuse me, take your headphones off and off your phone and say hi to me. No one's ever going to talk to you. <laughs> right? 
We all have that feeling too. I had it. I have it sometimes where I go uh, into an Uber and immediately have my headphones on and I'm looking down. I'm like, don't talk to me. Don't do that in life. You can't be complaining that, oh, no one's really uh, saying hi to me. I have a very low social circle. If that's what you're doing. The same with if all your, your day and night, you're just home alone all the time. You're not going out and putting yourself in situations where people are around you. Not much is going to change. So don't self-isolate. Okay. There's a few more. I need to look this up because these are so, so negative. I'm like, whoa. Um, oh, yeah, that one. <laughs> I would, uh, yeah, there's three more. One, the next thing I would do is I would always move away from what I'm feeling as opposed to towards what I'm feeling. And that's the default for a lot of people, actually. Meaning, I feel something a little uncomfortable within. What do we do? We try to move away from it. How can I get rid of this or forget about this or distract myself from this? And we might put on a TV, watch a show, go on social media, trying to avoid what we're feeling. Or we try to numb it. If I drink, if I eat, if I do drugs, if I smoke, is it gone yet? Moving away from it. People even fall into this trap with letting go, where they think that letting go is pushing something out. But then you're still labeling it as bad, trying to get rid of it. It's labeled. Again, it's like this bad thing you're resisting, and whatever you resist persists. So I would move away from everything I feel. I would never move towards it. I would also never laugh. And that, too, a big sign of success or a healthy human being is laughter. Don't fall for the marketing. It's not hustling and being miserable all the time. True success is, yeah, you're taking action. You have a goal, but you're laughing. You're in a good mood. You're enjoying it. If you're not enjoying the whole journey, you're chasing phantoms. Because in the end, too, what are you left with? Your relationship to the present moment. Whatever you feel most of the time, success isn't going to change that. You're going to find a way to feel the same way. If right now you're just, say, very bored all the time, here's tons of success. You might temporarily be, oh, literally, this is new. And you're going to find your way back right after that to the boredom. The patterns follow you. The example I always give, by the way, when it comes to this is a friend of mine. He's a poker player. And he took a six months break off of Instagram. And you want to know why he took the break? Because when he was at the bottom working up on his poker career, he would be scrolling and saying, ah, if I could only make enough money that I could go travel and be on those big yachts I see in the videos and the stories and like the exotic islands, I'd be so happy. That's missing from my life. And he worked his way up and he started going on the yachts. So he did it, right? He lived his ideal life from that perspective. And what did he catch himself doing on the yacht? Scrolling through Instagram. So you're like, I want to go there. And you're there and you're like, back to my comfort zone. He's like, okay, no more Instagram. Mm -hmm. The patterns follow your relationship to the present moment. The same with, by the way, success in money. It doesn't heal you. It just amplifies what's there. Let that land. If you're in a pattern now of numbing yourself, right? Like drinking, eating, drugs, so on and so forth. Escaping, distracting, PlayStation, TV. Say you were to make millions. The pattern would stay the same, but now you would just have a budget for it. Instead of distracting yourself with a PlayStation, you could distract yourself with tons of travel. You could go on the yacht to distract yourself, but that's just your new PlayStation. Instead of drinking cheap booze, you can go and get the most craft cocktails and order the most expensive bottles of wine, but you're still numbing yourself. Instead of just watching videos off an old computer or your phone, you could get the huge home cinema, but you're still doing the same thing. The patterns follow. It just amplifies it. Get it? So be aware of that. What's my relationship to the present moment? Am I enjoying the present moment? What's my relationship to me in the present moment? Do I love myself? Am I laughing? Am I in a good flow? Toxic, though, resist and never laugh. And the last thing I wrote here is if you told me to be extremely toxic, I would just let my ego take over. And what does your ego always say? More. Be better. Be different. Be special. Be superior. And I would also activate my winner effect by bringing others down. And be careful of this. You've probably heard about this term, winner effect. If not, there's a great book about it. It's called The Winner Effect. And ultimately, what it says is when, it feel, when you feel like you're winning, 
you tap into more of your, you could say, faculties. You just feel more confident. You can take up more space. You can talk louder. You're just in a good flow when you feel like you're winning. Now, there are three ways that people try to chase or activate this winner effect. One, which is the most toxic way, is bringing people down. If I make someone's self-esteem lower, I make them doubt themselves, I bring them down, then in contrast, I will feel like I'm winning and I'm better than them and superior than them and it'll activate my winner effect. Extremely toxic. Once more, everything I just talked about here, don't do it. But you'll catch it in others. You'll see people do that. Just always trying to just kind of bring you down so in contrast they feel like they're winning. Or even if you say something like, here's this great thing I did. They're like, oh, you did that? Here's what I did that's a little bit better than what you did. They'll do that a lot. Be aware. The next one is people are always trying to position themselves in situations where they have more, for example, competency or knowledge or simply due to the role, they are above people. Right? We call this also situational confidence. For example, at your job, if you're in a position where you have employees underneath you, in contrast to those employees, you have more status in the job itself. So you will be more confident than them just due to that context. You will feel like you're winning. But if you hang out with other people and it's not your job, suddenly you might sense yourself <gasps> stifle, like stifle up a bit. Right? Or if you know something more than someone else and you're the put in the teacher role, you will feel like you're winning and you will tap into confidence. Now, people will try to chase this situational confidence all the time or only go into these roles where they are in that specific context winning. However, the ultimate key, and this is how you affect, like ultimately permanently affect your or activate your winner effect, is withdrawing from that altogether. Because both are always in competitive. Who's above? Who's below? Am I above or am I below? Where do I stand? You just withdraw completely. And it's what we talked about earlier. Let go of approval, let go of disapproval. Learning how to let go. Let go of the self-hate inside. Let go of the self-attack. Let go of the doubts. Fall in love with yourself and then you will always feel like you are winning. And it's no longer in comparison to, it's just cause. It's at a core feeling like you're good enough. And that's true confidence. That's core confidence. Where it doesn't matter what happens out here, you're still you. It's I talked about before, it doesn't matter what the clothes are, I'm still me. It doesn't matter if there's approval, I'm still me. It doesn't matter if it's like, here's more money, I'm still me. Here's less money, I'm still me. Julian, you're great, I'm just me. Julian, you suck, I'm just me. I'm just me. Withdraw completely. Then you permanently activate it. And then you don't have to also have these big buildups. If you're someone who relies on momentum, a lot of momentum is that. Trying to activate your winner effect. You shouldn't have to build momentum. It should just be. If I come up here, I don't need to be like, okay, everyone, give me five minutes to just warm up a little bit. Okay, let me walk the crowd a little bit. Oh, cool. No, I'm just, I'm just me. Do you need to build momentum when you talk to your best friend? Yes? No? Like your best, best friend, assuming you have a best friend. Uh, are you like, okay, I'm about to meet my best friend. Let's be confident. No, you're just like, well, you can just crack into the jokes right off the bat. Well, if you can tap into that with your best friend, you can tap into it. Why not work on tapping into it with everyone? And that's letting go. So be aware of this, but most importantly, catch it in yourself, catch it in others, and do not do this.